Net Wealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with net wealths. The guests, organization, and net wealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through the net wealth platforms, and net wealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about net wealth can be found on our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please seek professional advice before acting. Welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast, brought to you by the Net Wealth Investment Research Team. In this podcast series, we pick the brains of key wealth management professionals to uncover opportunities and challenges for investors on a diverse range of topics. We hope you enjoy their unique perspectives. Welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. My name is Paul O'Connor and I'm the Head of Investment Management and Research. Today we welcome from Fidelity International, James Abella and Maroon Younes, who manage the Fidelity Future Leaders and Global Future Leaders Funds. Fidelity International is a privately owned and majority owned by its senior employees, with the balance held by the founding family. Fidelity International is separate from the US-based Fidelity Investments with a separate shareholder base and separate business and investment organisations. Research and trading capabilities were formally separated back in December 2013. Fidelity International manage over $282 billion US dollars in assets across multiple asset classes as of March last year. James Abella is the Portfolio Manager of the Fidelity Futures Leaders Fund, which was launched in 2013 and is the Co-Portfolio Manager for the Fidelity Global Future Leaders Fund, which was launched in 2020. Prior to this, James spent 10 years as an investment analyst. Maroon Nunes is a Portfolio Manager and Analyst at Fidelity based in Sydney and has 14 years experience in investment management. Maroon joined Fidelity as an investment analyst in 2012 and was appointed co-portfolio manager for the Fidelity Global Future Leaders Fund in 2020. There are 11 Fidelity managed funds on the NetWealth Super and IDPS investment menus, including both the Future Leaders and Global Future Leaders funds that James and Maroon manage. Australian investors have allocated to Australian mid- and small-cap equity strategies for many years, basically due to the larger alpha opportunity set available in these sectors. But we're now seeing an increasing interest and awareness in global mid- and small-cap strategies, based on the same premise, that these sectors also provide greater alpha opportunities to active managers. However, these strategies are typically more volatile when compared to the large and mega cap equity strategies, so it will be interesting to understand how James and Maroon view and manage risk. In addition, the recent economic and equity volatility post the outbreak of COVID would have tested the risk management processes embedded in active strategies, and we'll explore this area with James and Maroon this morning. Also, with the recent spike in inflation and debate now as to whether the recent rises is short-term due to supply constraints or structural, I'll be interested to discuss how a structural rise in inflation and interest rates may impact on the mid and global small cap equity sectors. To commence, James, you launched the Australian Future Leaders Fund about eight years ago, and in 2020, the Global Future Leaders Funds. There's been, I guess, active global mid and small cap strategies in the Australian market for a long time, but I guess just in recent years, we've seen a a particular increase in interest in these strategies. So what do you think is driving this increased interest? I think it's just that the system is heading towards $3 trillion in Australia now. And logically, I think it's part of a very good diversification strategy to get some global exposure. And the global exposures, I guess, just has a very, very big opportunity set. Uh, And a lot of people want to get, I guess, more diversification beyond beyond Australia, uh, which can be quite narrow and shallow, I guess, in a broad sense. Uh, so when you when you want to go into the global marketplace, this is the vehicle that that you can really go into, and the opportunity set I think is really really is really really large. Can I also add to that, Paul? Um, 
increasingly, as as the last few years have unfolded, the global broadcap space has become increasingly dominated by a handful of um, you know very large companies. Um, you know, or, almost to the same extent that you find in Australia, where you have a very high concentration at the top end. So, the the interest in global um, mid caps, um, in addition to all the the reasons James mentioned is also the fact that you have a much more diversified universe exposure to a broader range of, of, of companies um, and the index itself isn't dominated by four or five um, mega cap names. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. <coughs> sorry, I'll just Jones. come back sorry, on, on um, Maroon's point. So we've looked at it and the global has much bigger, I guess, long-term global leaders that are, as Maroon and I have discussed over the years, a lot of them are business to business um, as well as business to consumer, but they are really like future leaders and, and global mm. like market share winners and disruptors. So that's got 17% in tech and 17% in industrials. Uh, but Australia's domestically, it's a lot more cyclical. So today, 23% of the index is materials and 20% mm. is consumer. And all of those sort of long-term leaders like healthcare and tech are much smaller at around 7%. So you do get exposure to those long-term leaders, global platforms, disruptors, etc., innovators and leaders. Uh, and that's something that is, is available globally and just in more, much more volume than domestically. So the outbreak of COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the global economy and companies. So how has the global mid and small cap companies sector been impacted? And how have these companies, I guess, adapted to a post-COVID world? And I guess compared to the large and the mega cap stocks, um, do they have enough capital to, to have adjusted quickly enough to the changing nature of the economy? Yeah, so it's 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 interesting. It's it's probably worth just taking a step back and just um, framing um, the definition of mid cap. So so to a, to a normal person, mid cap might sound quite small, but actually by global definitions, uh, mid cap is, is is quite a broad universe. So it, it encompasses anything really from a market cap of about one billion US up uh, up in excess of thirty billion. Um, so despite the name, a lot of these companies are very well capitalized. Um, and a lot of the companies are uh, leaders in in their respective fields. They may be uh, very niche B two B providers, but they're quite dominant. So, uh, a lot of companies, um, particularly in the high quality um, spectrum, uh, have you know access to a lot of liquidity, a lot of cash, very strong balance sheets, um, and and our process itself lends itself to finding uh, those such companies. So, we've been able to um, navigate. Uh, the last 12 months um, by sticking to primarily to higher quality companies that can survive the pandemic. And then in terms of, you know, operational um, efficiencies that the companies can can generate, I mean, it's, it's the same playbook there that, that you would find in, in, in the large cap end of town. A lot of companies um, saved money on travel expenses. A lot of companies were looking at um, unnecessary um, marketing expenses. Um, a lot of companies got access to particular um, government funding or grants, uh, things of that nature, R and D grants, etc. So th- th- there's there's been a lot of liquidity injected into the system as well from a for fiscal and monetary perspective. So we we haven't actually seen um, a lot by way of bankruptcies. We haven't seen a lot by way of very dilutive um, equity equity or capital raisings either. So that, that that's sort of been a, a surprising thing I'd, I'd say over the past 12, 18 months. Hmm. Yeah, well, I guess it's an interesting point you make there that um, the the global mid cap stocks, if they were listed on the ASX, they'd probably be a large cap stock. <laughs> um, so I think it's an important point for uh, for investors to understand when they're allocating to these that the the mid cap companies are typically a lot larger by market cap when compared to an Australian mid cap company. The sector's generated strong returns over the last 12 months, like all listed equity markets. But how have global mid and small cap sectors performed over the last five years? And what's been driving the performance in the global mid and small cap sector? Is it perhaps growth IT related stocks like uh, we mentioned earlier? What's been driving returns in the in the mega cap section of the um, of the MSCI World Exchange? Yes, yeah, so, so the performance definitely over the past 12 months has, has been very strong. Um, I think it's sort of been in, in the region of about 40%. But the 
uh, returns over the past four or five years have, have been also quite healthy. Um, that they probably haven't had as much airtime um, as sort of the, the mega cap end, just because of the the attention grabbing headlines that you get. But I mean, this is the sort of sector. This is the sort of space that could you know quite easily generate sort of low double digit returns through the cycle, and, and that's one of the things that you know we we find very interesting and very attractive about it. In terms of what's driven that. Um, there, there has been some some um, growth driven by IT, um, but it is, as James mentioned a little bit earlier, it is a more diverse um, universe by sector than than what the large cap end of town. So really, the the, the drivers of the growth has, have been uh, varied across sector, but it, the, the common theme across all of them is is long term structural winners that have been able to sort of compound and grow their revenue, compound and grow their earnings. And those are the sorts of companies that have been able to drive the asset class performance over a longer period of time. And, and those sorts of business models, uh, we can find them in uh, technology, we can find them in healthcare, we can find them in a lot of um, dominant sort of consumer areas, um, as well as industrials. There, there, there's, there's a group of very high quality industrials that sit within the global mid cap universe. Um, and, and so it's really been spread across uh, multiple different sectors. So, James, you launched the Fidelity Australian Future Leaders Fund just on eight years ago, and Maroon, you've covered mid and small cap uh, equities across most sectors of the Australian market, so you both have a lot of experience in Australian small caps. Can you take us through the differences between the Australian mid and small cap universe when compared to the opportunities in the global mid and small cap universe? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Paul, and one that we you know, is very worth considering. There's two very, very big factor differences between them. So the first one is there's a much higher valuation discipline at the index level and then also at the stock level. So what we see at individual stock names is you get some very high quality businesses that may generate, you know, say 15 to 20% return on equity, but the valuations are maybe 20 or 30 times, sometimes 40 times. But in Australia, when you do get these high ROE, high ROE structural winners, they can get up to 100 times. There's a number of names like today. You've got WiseTech uh, and also ProMedicus, so one in tech, one in healthcare, and they're on PEs that are over 100 times. Whereas in the um, the global context, it's it's actually you know there's lower frequency of that sort of incidence. The second one, which is a big one as well, is a lower incidence of success in the momentum factor. And in Australia, and especially Australian small caps, is a, it's a very significant factor. So somewhere between three, four, sometimes five years out of a decade, momentum is one of the key factors that drive success and outperformance. Whereas globally, it's much less. It's, it's one to two years uh, out of 10 that, that drives the success factor. So as a result of that, we've adjusted our long-term strategic weights in the portfolio construction uh, matrix that we use that we call QMTV or quality, momentum, transition and value. And the mix of that um, in Australia is 40, 30, 20, 10. So 40% quality, strategic long-term weight, 30% momentum, 20% transition, 10% value with a 10% sort of movement either way for tactical, tactical positioning. The global basis, considering those two factors uh, of greater valuation discipline and less momentum factor driving the market, we've ended up with a strategic weight of 40, 30, 20, 10 for quality value transition uh, momentum. So it's it's 40% quality, which is similar to the Aussie one. Again, you can see what Maroon and I are saying. It's a quality skewed portfolio, um, but then it's 30% value. 20% 20% transition, 10% momentum with, again, that 10% tactical tilt either way. Um, and the portfolio that it's constructed today is one that Maroon and I are very proud of. It's it's very high return um, in absolute sense, in a relative sense, but the valuation premiums we're paying maybe 10 to 15% above the index, where the ROE is between 50 and 75% higher than the index. So that's really a great portfolio construction process and the filtering down of the number of names into that 50, 50 to 60 names that we hold today um, is something that you know comes from the bottom up, but also the portfolio construction piece. And that factors in the differences between the Aussie market and the global marketplace. 
Gee, that's interesting, the comments you make there about momentum and um, not being as great a driver of returns in the sector there. And I guess as you were talking there, I was thinking in my mind, I wonder what's actually driving that. Is that the increasing, I guess, use of passive investment that's uh, investing or has a larger uh, has a larger allocation to the large and the mega cap companies? But I guess it's not surprising as well. It sounds quite rational that ultimately the take out there is that it's a... It's a bit more of a fertile, I guess, fishing pond for active managers in a more true sense than um, than uh, the larger and mega cap stocks. I think there's a lot more eyes looking at the global marketplace, and I think that tends to lead mm. into a greater valuation discipline. And there are there are more people chasing ideas, but there's more discipline around what they pay for those ideas because I think they see the competition, they see the options, they see the marketplace much more broadly and the number of options is also much broader. So Maroon and I have commented many times over the years that Australia is is a narrow and shallow market. So when you get a great idea, like whether it's Mm. Altium or WiseTech or Prometicus, that is very unique and very different and very high return, say 20 to 25% return on capital, that becomes very, very unique. And so that the chase to actually want to own it becomes quite aggressive and euphoric and that's how these stocks end up on 100 times PEs Um, whereas in a global marketplace you may have say two or three leaders in the market there may be five or six me twos and in a marketplace there may be two leaders but there's a group of five or six groups of companies that are in a certain marketplace Um, and so it's not chased as aggressively and as euphorically as the Australian marketplace. So that does lead to the momentum factor and the valuation discipline kind of underneath being the outcomes of the market structure and also the visibility of investors on on what the market is, the marketplace that they operate in. Uh, Very interesting. Very interesting. The Australian small cap sector is concentrated, as we've been saying, by a number of industries. Um, whilst the global mid and small cap universe is far larger and more diverse. So can you provide the listeners with some insights into how the sectors differ by industry type and and what type of industries can you get exposure to in the global sense that you really struggle to get exposure to in the Australian market? Yeah, I'll just... I think, look, the big things is global is really led by tech and industrials. As Mira and I have mentioned, I think global tech, uh, global industrials and global sort of consumer names and global consumer leading brands are the ones that are really the future leaders opportunities in global. And I've said before, in terms of um, Aussie, a lot of it is is years of time. So in Australia, uh, tends to be small caps tend to be three to five year old companies. So you think of them like like a junior school, whereas high school is more mid caps. Um, but once they get to sort of ten or eleven years old, they tend to and if they're successful, tend to end up in large cap land, which is above that ten billion mark. But because we do have that thirty billion dollar bandwidth. You can follow companies for 10 and sometimes 20 years that are really successful um, before they end up becoming large caps. Uh, But the ultimate mix of the sectors is really a tech is 17%, industrials are 17%, and that dominates global, whereas Australia is a lot more cyclical. So you've got 23% of the index is uh, materials and consumers around 20%. And those sort of big long-term decade or two-decade winners in healthcare and tech uh, they're really small in terms of seven, eight percent of the index. So the opportunity set is is fairly narrow. You, you know, it's probably ten to fifteen really amazing companies. Whereas in in the global context, there are literally hundreds that we can find, and we've got to make decisions over which ones we want to own. Um, and I think that that just gives you a, a feel for the scale of the opportunity set um, and where the index has, has led over the years is a lot more of those. Yeah, tech industrials, healthcare and global, whereas Aussie, it's a bit more narrow and a bit more cyclical. Before we bring you the second part of this chat, a little bit about who we are. NetWealth is an ASX listed company established to help Australians take control of their financial futures. With a wide range of super and investment accounts, a huge variety of investment options and market-leading online tools, we can help you manage your wealth your way. Partner with us to see wealth differently and discover a brighter future. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS, which you should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. So given the 
differences, I guess, between the, the global and the Australian sectors. How do your strategies, investment styles differ in any way? And how do you actually cover the global mid and small cap universe to arrive at that portfolio of, say, 50 stocks, given how big the index is? Yeah, Maroon, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, James James sort of touched a little bit on the difference between um, QMTV and QVTM. So as a starting point between looking at the Australian strategy and the global strategy, that's sort of the key difference um, in that regard. And, and that comes back to comments that we mentioned earlier about um, having a broader, deeper, wider market than, than is available in Australia. Um, now, just to sort of take a step back, I guess, um, our universe um, by if you sort of use the global definition of mid cap, um, the investable companies out there is sort of in, in the region of about 4000 names. Um, the index itself um, has about 1000 names in there. And this is the MSCI global mid cap index. Um, so it is a very, very large universe. Um, and then we, we go through, you know, multiple steps to sort of filter it down and, and narrow it down to sort of a, a short list um, of names that we can sort of look at a lot more um, intensely. So, you know, the, the, the first step will be to um, employ a quality screening filter. And so this will, this will involve looking at um, cash flow return on investment. This will look at screening out companies um, that have um, unsustainable debt, that have um, very poor ESG. Um, and, and very low persistence. So, so one of the one of the key things that we employ um, is is you know a, a three pillared um, process which focuses on viability, sustainability, and credibility. And this is sort of at the stock selection level. And so, what we're looking for is is high quality companies that can sustain um, the duration of their margin and return profile well into the future. So, what we're looking for is persistency. We're looking for durability. Uh, and so that's sort of the first step. The next step is um, utilizing the extensive fidelity network across the world. Now we're very, very blessed to have a uh, extensive network of, of portfolio managers and analysts around the world. Uh, we have in excess of 100 analysts on the ground um, in almost every continent around the world looking at these companies. So here we're talking to our analysts, we're, we're finding what the best ideas are, we're finding um, the long-term winners, what are the um, higher conviction names, and we really utilising the, 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 the network itself. The next step from there really is um, looking at, at a stock, stock level, the viability, sustainability and credibility, which is, is something I, I sort of mentioned there a little bit earlier. Um, so now that we've narrowed the universe down, we can look at each stock that's left um, in a lot more detail, scoring them on those three factors. And then the next step from there is really looking at the portfolio risk uh, from a QVTM perspective. So we're looking at um, are there sort of concentrations of risks? Are there pockets of risk where we're exposed to a particular macro factor or a particular event? Uh, and this really in, in, infers um, how the portfolio is shaping up to be. And then the final stage is the valuation filter. So we're, we're looking at things both from an absolute and relative valuation, and then sort of looking at uh, valuations in the context of whether these are structural stocks or cyclical stocks, um, because, because it is a sort of a, a major consideration for us. And so ultimately, when, when you bring and distill all of that down together, the position size that you get in the end um, and our, our portfolio um, is, is, is designed to be 40 to 70 holdings. And, and since inception, we've sort of drifted around the 50-55 the mark. Uh, but the position size reflects our conviction. It reflects the VSC scores. It reflects um, the risk management at the portfolio level. Um, and then making sure we balance having exposure to stocks without having a, a high degree of risk embedded in the portfolio. Yes, and I guess uh, thinking as you're making the comments there, Maroon, that um, yeah, that extensive network of analysts that globe that Fidelity have globally um, would be a real benefit, I guess, to to being able to tap into their ideas, their thoughts, and I'm assuming Fidelity have mid and small cap US equity strategies in the market there, so yes. you would uh, you would have quite a um, quite a, a number of resources that you could also get views and opinions on. Absolutely. In terms of, I guess, James and Maroon, are there any lessons or observations you've learned from managing Australian and mid, Australian mid and small cap uh, portfolios that can be applied to global mid and small caps? 
And so, look, many of the lessons that we've learned are really embedded in those two processes that Maroon's mentioned. So uh, for me, I've been doing small caps for 20 years and then running money specifically in Australian small caps for the 10 years. And what I've noticed is just it's very, very ingrained that viability, sustainability, credibility, which is your stock picking tool and your stock picking filter to avoid uh, future failures and find future winners, uh, future leaders, is really, really the key at the bottom up level. So. I'll just touch on that in a bit of detail. So viability is about returns. Uh, it's how, the, the level of the return, so the percentage of return on capital, uh, what's the direction of that, what's the persistency of that, um, how cyclical is that? that. That's really what your return, what I call your return reality is. Sustainability is about how long that return reality lasts for. Is it, If it's a single mine in a single location, um, then that's pretty high risk. Uh, if it's, uh, say, Sydney Airport and one location with a 99-year monopoly uh, asset, that, that's a phenomenal asset. Or a, or a global um, tech company or a global healthcare company where you could fit the players of that marketplace on the palm of your hand. So there are five pl- players in the world that solve that problem for the world. And that is a phenomenal, uh, you know, very, very sustainable position for, for decades or more. Um, and that's that's about duration. And then credibility is really about trust. So, <clears throat> excuse me, do you trust yourself? Uh, do you trust your accounts? Do you trust management? Can you verify what you're thinking, what you're saying, what management is saying? And then is it very transparent? So these are the things in terms of trust. So these are the three big lessons I've learned and most of the, the the future failures start from a credibility side. So you do have either a breach of trust um, in your own ability to trust management, your own ability to see things, uh, or all the accounts. So the earnings quality starts to deteriorate as a leading indicator. And that's where you find future failures. Whereas future leaders start from a very high return business, which is very long duration, There's very high trust in credibility and it's important and it's ingrained in management's behaviours, processes, thoughts and culture. And that is a business that you want to find and hold on for. Um, And that's really all the stock picking tool is. And then above that uh, is really about the portfolio construction uh, tool and control of portfolio risks. And that's where uh, QVTM comes in. So quality, value, transition, momentum. And that one is important because the paradigm of your mindset as an investor is very deeply ingrained in what you believe a company is. Um, So if you do think it's a high quality company, your risk is you're falling in love with the stock. You fall in love with the business, just like a business school basic. It's high return. It's a beautiful business. It's what you could think of as a beautiful compounder. But the reality is that businesses and 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 the competition nature of the world is that quality does break quality does erode and that love will eventually fade and you will have either competition high capex uh, management complacency or arrogance or very excessive valuations and when those things start to erode the beautiful love story then the risks are there um in, in value, you can also have value traps or you can have a really good value opportunity. Your question is if you've got a balance sheet um, that's going to blow up or a management team that's going to blow up, you're probably you know going to be in trouble. Or if you're a structural loser, you're going to be in trouble. But if you've got a value opportunity, which is a good business, very stable and good returns, it can be really exciting. Um, transition is more the in-between, in-between world and sort of a little bit like no man's land, but it, it's where things come through value into transition. And momentum really is your consensus trades. You're really kind of hot things that are very thematic. They're very cool. They're very hip. They're very now. There's upgrades and multiple expansion. They're very popular. And in that environment, much more like a like a herd environment, sort of the, the madness of crowds, you get into animal spirits risk. And when you get, in my world, peak valuation, peak sentiment, um, and also peak earnings, uh, you've pretty much reach the top of the cycle and animal spirits risk is becoming very, very poignant and you've got to be really, really careful. So for me, they're the big lessons that we've learned and as Maroon's outlined our process, those two stock level processes and the portfolio construction level process are embedded into our filtering process, which lead us to finding for us the 50 future leaders that we want to invest in. 
So the US mid and small cap market's been one of the best performing equity markets, I guess, over the long, long and long term, and makes up probably about 57% of the global mid and small cap index by market cap. So I'm not surprised it's the biggest overweight in your fund. Can you talk us through about why the US market continues to dominate this sector? And, you know, do you find many good ideas in other regions or countries? Or should investors not even bother with you? European or Asian mid and small cap stocks? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the US, um, as you mentioned, it, it's not surprising that it is the, the largest. I mean, the US has a very long um, and very ingrained culture of, of innovation. They attract the brightest minds from all around the world. Um, they have, you know, very broad, very deep, uh, very liquid markets. So, so it naturally is the home for a lot of um, attractive long term growing companies. Um, now today it makes up around seventy percent of our our um, portfolio, and that's really because we've been able to find you know a, a large number of high returning businesses based there. Um, also, businesses that are dominant in the US usually find it a lot easier to expand outside the US and dominate the global universe as opposed to sort of an Australian company dominating Australia and then going outside and, and trying to dominate the world because. The U.S. market is so big. If you become dominant in your home market, um, your revenues, your R and D, your cash flow, um, the magnitude of all of that, just and the resources that you can develop by dominating your home market, then just lets you go out and expand beyond uh, very, very easily. Um, so you end up finding a lot of global dominant companies that are based in the U.S. Uh, and then just that that sort of culture of innovation, education, um, leadership, entrepreneurial spirit, you know, it, it, it's very ingrained in the US culture. Um, the, the other two sort of major um, jurisdictions in our, in our universe would be Europe and Japan. Um, we do find ideas there. We have exposure to both of them. Um, but it is fair to say for us and, and for our style and what we're looking for, it has been um, slightly slimmer pickings in, in Europe and Japan. So Europe... Um, has has been going through obviously a very tough sort of post GFC period. Growth has been very very anemic. Um, there's some issues there around politics. Some issues there around demographics. Um, and then uh, Japan, similar sort of issues around demographics. Um, also in Japan, you find um, some governance issues. A lot of companies have got these cross shareholding structures, and and board representation isn't isn't progressive. And so for those reasons, you sort of combine them together. It, it, it does make it harder for us to find ideas in Europe and Japan. But, but by no means have we given up on them and, and, and we continue to you know, find some ideas there and, and, and they are represented in the fund. So what are the key risks to focus on when you're managing a global mid and small cap portfolio? So look, yeah, markets have been really strong. As we've said, the index is up sort of 40% for the year. But over over time, it's sort of been that 10 to 15% compound return. But the risks at the moment, I definitely would say, would be valuation will be the big one, one that you know many people have commented on. Uh, so to, f- to frame that risk return, we, we look at valuation quite a lot. So we look at the price to earnings ratio and of the, of the fund today, the price to earnings ratio is around a 20 level, 20 times, which is which is which is elevated, but it's really not too far above average, and certainly it's very close to the index. Uh, and the price to book of around two point four times uh, is, is a little bit above average, but again, not not very very far away. Um, and then if you look at returns on capital um, of the index, they're around sort of eleven percent, whereas the, our returns are around sort of seventeen. So we're quite a bit, as I mentioned, above the benchmark, but. All those parameters look pretty normal. And the important one when you think about valuations and also cheap debt, the debt levels are around 30%, which are also very normal and quite low and reasonable. So for us, we've focused then back on risks. So we go back into our process. And I think today, the four key things you need to focus on beyond valuation is really pricing power, market structure, earnings growth, and sustainability. Um, and certainly the fund is balanced between having those cyclical winners and the long-term winners, um, uh, but also the, those factors that are really going to be changing, whether you know, at the moment we're still in COVID uh, around the world, but as we come out of COVID and interest rates go up and inflation starts to rise, you're really going to be need to think about pricing power a lot more because you will have uh, rising input costs, inflation, tight labour markets, which we're seeing everywhere, 
sustainability will become more of an issue because credit costs are rising and competition is rising everywhere. Um, valuation discipline is high, uh, needs to be high because asset prices are at record and also duration needs to be brought back to the thought process because you've had a lot of cyclical winners or winners because of very generous markets, very cheap debt, very easy bond market, as Maroon mentioned. And the liquidity has been over $20 trillion liquidity pumped into the system. So that's been a very, very favourable market for a lot of companies and made things a lot easier uh, in terms of cost of capital and burdens to capital. Um, so you need to think, is this a structural or cyclical winner? Um, and is it all you know? Is it all sustainable? So I think they're they're the key issues you really need to think about at this point in time. Does a potential structural rise in inflation worry you, and the impact it'll have on the um, on the global mid and small cap uh, sector? Um, Maroon, do you want to touch on inflation? Yeah, I mean that that's definitely something that we we have spent a lot of time over the past sort of seven or eight months thinking about. That was that was sort of something that we thought long and hard about. Um, probably about a year ago, just sort of seeing the policy response um, and and sort of, you know, we, we started to take some steps towards positioning for that. And, and that sort of um, started to come to fruition earlier this year, um, probably the first four or five months of this year. Uh, but I think... You know, it's it's one of those things where you want to have a balance. Like, I, I, I'm I'm not sure you want to skew heavily one way or the other, and 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 debt the entire portfolio on inflation coming back or disinflation. And so, what we've what we're really trying to do is is find the right balance of of having companies um, that will benefit if inflation comes back, but then also having companies that will benefit if inflation subsides once again and bond yields uh, start to drift back down again lower. And it's really finding that middle ground that works for us. Maybe to conclude, what role do you guys believe a, a global mid and small cap strategy plays in an investor's diversified portfolio? Uh, I'd say, look, I... Uh... It's a very attractive risk return profile. There are many amazing ideas that are witnessed delivered phenomenal returns for clients over the last 10 years. And just to give the Australian context, you've had realestate.com.au. It's gone from 20 cents, uh, say 20 years ago, uh, to now it's $160. That's a phenomenal return. Uh, Domino's was a few dollars uh, when it when it IPO'd um, 15 years ago. And today it's it's around 100 and over $100. Uh, JB Hi-Fi as well, a few dollars IPO, and today it's at $50 around. Sydney Airport was a small cap. Today it's a large cap and now being offered uh, for takeover. Uh, James Hardy, again, a, a small Australian company, has now gone global, and, and we really, you know, we even own that in the, in the uh, global fund because it has been a huge success story globally. And then things like Cochlear and CSL. These are names over 10 to 20 years have, have gone up multiple times. Um, so that's what you're really looking for. So for me, we're very, very looking forward to uh, finding these ideas over the next decade in the global context. Um, and I do think they're a very good part of a diversified uh, portfolio for a very attractive risk return um, for individual investors and for the Australian you know, superannuation system, which is $3 trillion in, in, in scale. Um, it's a very, attractive, um, a very attractive market for that world as well. Yes, and I, I guess my thoughts there um, would be that the global mid and small cap sector is a fertile ground for alpha and opportunity. And as an investment consultant, I think it, I have a higher level of confidence that if I find the right active management team, that we can genuinely add value. Whereas, you know, it, it obviously gets more difficult and challenging in the mega cap uh, section of the market there. So I think A, the alpha opportunity, and then B, I do think there has been some, you know, Australians very much embraced emerging markets in their portfolios from a risk budgeting perspective well over a decade ago. And I, I think the, the, the question is still out there about how successful some of those strategies have been. So I have, I guess, seen a number of portfolios move the risk budget from EM to now global mid and small cap stocks. So for mine, I think that investors really need to think about um, in their diversified portfolio portfolio, what sources of alpha opportunity that do they genuinely have? And I do believe that a mid and small cap active strategy can really add value overall in the portfolio. So 
Um, on that note, I think we will conclude, but James and Maroon, I, I would just like to thank you very much for the time and your insights this morning. It's certainly been interesting to have the discussion and to understand more about um, about global mid and small cap stocks there. So I thank you for uh, for your input this morning to the Netwealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. To the listener, thank you again for joining us. I hope you have found today's um, podcast valuable and informative. Um, And I wish you all the best through these challenging times that we're continuing to live through. So again, James and Maroon, thank you again uh, for participating in the podcast. And to the listeners, I look forward to joining you on the next instalment. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. For more episodes and to subscribe to our series, visit our website www.netwealth.com.au or visit the iTunes Store or Spotify. We hope you can tune into our next episode.